Sego, and welcome to part three of this series of videos on Iroquoian armor. If you haven't seen the previous videos, I recommend watching them before proceeding with this one. In today's video, we are going to be taking a more detailed look at the back shield, as this is perhaps the most unusual component of the armor. As previously mentioned, back shields like this are not entirely without precedent. We see a number of similar armors in various cultures around the world, and I'm going to be using some of these to help interpret the armor. In my previous video, I talked about some of the ways in which the back shield protects you from the enemy. Since recording that video, I've done some tests, I've given some thought, and I've spoken to some people who know a thing or two. And I've come to the conclusion that all of the potential benefits of the back shield that I mentioned previously are of secondary importance to a different purpose. I now believe that the primary purpose of the back shield is not to protect me from my enemies, but is to protect me from my allies, and to protect my allies in turn. Following the publication of Part 2, I was made aware of the purpose of the back shields in an Inuit context, these armors having been used recently enough for some information about them to have survived. The idea with these armors is that behind the front rank of the experienced warriors, the men of proper fighting age, you would have the less experienced fighters, the teenage boys and the like. These would throw stones and the like over the heads of the front ranks. The back shields allowed this to be done safely. Without these back shields, every stone that you threw had a chance of injuring, perhaps severely, the man in front of you. Now, contrary to what popular culture would have you believe, the second, third, etc. rank of a battle line is of very limited usefulness until the front rank starts to thin out a little bit. Because of the erratic way that a human moves around, particularly when in combat, the rear ranks need to be very careful with any action they take so as not to injure the front rank. Because of this, the movie and video game idea of the swordsman in front, archers behind formation is largely a myth. If you were a commander stupid enough to employ this tactic, you'd end up with a lot of your men shot in the back of the head at point-blank range. In the real world, generally the archers and the slingers will move to the front rank before shooting, and they will stop shooting when things fall to hand to hand. These back shields allow the second rank to continue to use their long-range attacks even once battle has closed. And I hypothesize that the same must also be true for Iroquoian back shields. But wait, I hear some of you say. Surely a good helmet, a good suit of armor, will protect you from your allies just as well as a funny-looking back shield. Well, that might not necessarily be true. The overwhelming majority of helmets throughout history only partially cover the head. Furthermore, even if a blow fails to penetrate a helmet, the force of it can still disorient you or hurt you quite badly. On a back shield like this, there's a good three or four inches between the shield and your head. So while a good helmet might provide some protection from blows from behind, a back shield like this renders you almost immune to them, allowing your compatriots to throw projectiles over your head without fear. To demonstrate this point, I've enlisted the help of my brother. First, I'm getting him to launch snowballs over my shoulder using a lacrosse stick. The stick works very well for this. So well, in fact, that I hypothesized that this might have been its original purpose. But that's a digression for another time. As you can see here, the worst case scenario is that he hits the top of my helmet and maybe knocks it off. Next, I'm getting him to shoot some arrows over my shoulder. It's not ideal shooting by any means, but it's perfectly feasible. This brings up another reason why, generally speaking, archers would be moved to the front of a formation before shooting. Because I'm in the way, he can't sight down the shaft as he would normally do, and in order to hit the hypothetical target, he has to not only aim high, but not pull the string back as far as he normally would. But even if his shooting isn't ideal, it's still better that he be helping out, rather than waiting for me to fall for his turn at the front. There's another benefit to the back shield that goes hand in hand with the ones I've just mentioned. And this is the protective value of the shield to the men behind me. To demonstrate this, I got my brother to stand behind me while my sister throws snowballs at us. I should have put the camera closer to where she was standing. From her perspective, the only bits of my brother that she could see were the sides of his legs. Something of note here is how difficult it is to stand still when someone is throwing things at you. When planning this test, I had intended to hold the shield in a fairly neutral position and just see what the armor could do. To my dismay, I find myself reflexively moving the shield to catch them. Eventually, I force myself to hold the shield low, but 
Now I find myself flinching and dodging out of the way. One of these times, I dodge so far out of the way as to expose my brother. This brings up an interesting idea, that perhaps the Iroquoian warrior might have had to train himself not to dodge. That's just a thought, though. Following the test, my sister reported that the only way she could have possibly hit my brother was by throwing a snowball between my legs and hitting him in the shins. Anything that might have hit him was caught by the shield. But wait, I can hear some of you say. Surely it's more efficient to use a great big handheld shield than strap something awkward to your back. There's a couple of reasons why a back shield might be preferable. Firstly, I can shield the person behind me more closely with the back shield than I can with a handheld shield. Because the back shield is closer than a handheld shield to the man behind me, any projectiles striking him have to come in at a steeper angle. An arrow with a steep arc has less power and accuracy than an arrow with a flat arc. But I hear you say, surely he could defend himself better by carrying the shield himself rather than leaving it to me. This is where things tie back into the first point I was making. Throwing projectiles requires two hands. The front rank wearing a back shield means that the second rank doesn't have to carry a shield, thus freeing up an extra hand and allowing him to shoot over the back. I made another observation that helps to convince me of these ideas, this observation being the angled edges of the wings. I put together this composite image to help illustrate. Notice how when you put several of these suits of armor together, the back plates lock together like the battlements on a castle, with the angled edges forming crenellations through which to look and to shoot. So, in summary, the back plate's primary purpose is to allow my allies to use their projectile weapons safely. That's all I have to say. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.